On Easter Monday, 1916, armed nationalist rebels marched into Dublin city centre and seized the General Post Office, proclaiming the birth of an Irish Republic independent of British rule. Elsewhere in the city, rebel forces took over a number of positions in what was the centre of British colonial rule in Ireland. In 1916, Dublin was the capital of British colonial rule in Ireland. Here were based the security forces, the Governor General and the First Secretary, the British administration in Ireland. On Easter Monday 1916, rebel forces seized the GPO and Padraig Pearce, the man chosen as President of the New Irish Republic, read out a Declaration of Independence. What follows a week of street fighting, which would leave central Dublin in ruins and in flames. But something had changed, as the poet W.B. Yeats said, changed utterly. The rebels numbered a thousand at the start, but would grow to 1,600 fighters over the coming days. The British authorities were caught unaware by the rising and only had a few hundred troops available in the city that Easter Monday. Reinforcements were hurriedly rushed in from elsewhere in Ireland and from Britain. For five days, the Irish Republicans fought British forces brought to recapture the city. They used artillery to blast the rebel positions and much of inner city Dublin. By the following Sunday, the rebels had been forced to surrender. The GPO was in flames and the Republicans had been forced to evacuate it. The commanders gave the order to surrender to prevent further civilian casualties. For two years, Britain had been fighting Germany and its allies in what came to be termed the Great War. For the British, the insurrection in Dublin was a stab in the back. For the rebels, England's difficulty is Ireland's opportunity. In 1916, Ireland was formally part of the United Kingdom, but was in effect a colony run by a viceroy and with an armed police force more concerned with crushing opposition to British rule than fighting crime. The majority of Irish voters backed the Irish National Party, whose MPs at Westminster championed the creation of a devolved Irish Parliament, but not independence. In 1912, the government in London was a minority liberal administration which retained office through the support of those Irish MPs. The price they demanded was a Home Rule Bill setting up an Irish Parliament. There was one part of Ireland where the population was in the main opposed to Home Rule. In the Belfast area, a majority of the population were Protestant, whereas overall a majority of the Irish population were Catholic. Belfast was the only industrial centre in Ireland. Its factories and shipyards depended on British orders, investment and coal. Their owners feared any lessening of the link with Britain. Backed by the opposition Conservative Party, these unionists raised and armed a militia with rifles bought in Germany. The British Army in Ireland refused government orders to seize these weapons. In reaction, the nationalist Irish volunteers were formed, and they too bought rifles from Germany. But when they were landed, British troops opened fire on crowds celebrating in Dublin, killing four unarmed civilians. In 1914, the Ulster Volunteer Force landed 25,000 rifles at two ports in the north of Ireland. Neither the police nor the British Army intervened to stop the importation of these weapons, and they were distributed to UVF members across the north of Ireland. In July 1914, the Irish Volunteers landed 900 rif rifles at Hoth, just outside Dublin. The police and the army were mobilised. They failed to intercept the rifles, but that afternoon, crowds celebrating their arrival on the streets of Dublin were opened fire at by members of the British Army. Four unarmed civilians were killed. The gun had been reintroduced into Irish politics. In London, there was fear that Ireland and Britain was on the edge of civil war. The outbreak of World War I in August 1914 seemed to have brought this crisis to an end. Both the Irish National Party and the Unionists rallied in support of the war. The leaders of the National Party pledged that the Irish volunteers would enlist in the British Army and toured the country urging men to volunteer. A minority of the Irish volunteers broke away in opposition to the war. The Republicans among them believed that with Britain at war, 
This was the best time to strike a blow for Irish freedom. By Easter 1916, they had prepared an elaborate plan for a nationwide uprising planned for Easter Sunday. But the leaders of the Irish volunteers called it off. Nevertheless, the Republicans and a small socialist militia went ahead with the rising 24 hours later. What followed was to shape modern Ireland. And what was Ireland's position within the British Empire? It's important to see the um, Ireland was really, in retrospect, we say a colony, but that wasn't the official view. Officially, it was a part of the, the Union. There was a Union successively with Wales and Scotland, and then later there was a, an act of Union with Ireland, uh, in which Ireland had been brought into um, the Union much as Scotland had been, but perhaps with even less um, uh, consultation or, or popular support, the greater mass of the Irish people were uh, Catholics and not really a part of the political process. They had no representatives to speak for them. And the men that negotiated their way into the um, Union were mostly uh, English landlords who were uh, the beginnings of a, a, what they called an ascendancy, an establishment, an English establishment in Ireland. At the beginning of the 20th century, swathes of the map of the world were painted red. It was said that the sun never set on the British Empire. The jewel in the crown of that empire was India. But in the years before the outbreak of the First World War, Whitehall's attention was focused on unrest in Ireland. There was an awareness in London that if the Irish sought independence, that would encourage people in India, and indeed Egypt, Iraq and elsewhere, to go down the same road. And it stiffened resistance to more any concessions towards Irish nationalism. Well, first of all, you had uh, an initial period of stability. After the famine, the British government uh, helped to buy out the landlord class created a, I wouldn't say comfortable, but a small farming class that owned their own property. But really, that period which we know as Redmondism, which was following the Irish Parliamentary Party, or John Redmond, began to come to a close when, for example, in Britain, the Tory party openly called for a support for an insurrection against their own government which had planned to bring in home rule. Uh, that helped to radicalise many Irish people. Initially, that radicalisation dipped when the First World War occurred, but as soon as the British began to try to bring in conscription, radicalisation increased again, and this meant the stage was set for major changes in Ireland uh, from 1916 onwards. Britain. Was that enthusiasm for the war slipping by 1916? Well, that's, I think, Honestly, all enthusiasm for the war was slipping by 1916, but very few people knew how to say uh, what they meant. Um, recruitment was difficult everywhere, but it was particularly difficult in Ireland because of the failure of their hopes. They, they had a real belief that they could be um, honoured in the fighting, that, they would, that their contribution would be recognised. and. Uh, the stupid ways that the um, often um, orange, as we would call them, or Protestant or English officers dealt with their troops meant that they couldn't get that respect. They, they weren't allowed a badge. You know, every regiment had a badge, um, often with a, a, a local or a national symbol. But, uh, and the Irishmen said they want a harp. They would like a harp. Um, a, a national symbol, not a revolutionary one, but one that honoured Ireland. They said, no, no, you can't have a harp. And um, they were used really as cannon fodder, and I think they felt that more and more in the, the unwillingness of the English to give them officers. There were very few Irish officers trained. Uh, they were mostly put under um, people who were largely hostile to their religion and their um, uh, ideals, who were English and Unionist, and often from the Protestant minority in the North. Sometimes people say the Easter Rising was a blood sacrifice, uh, assuming somehow that people went out to be martyrs. 
But in reality, I think that uh, it was more similar to the uprising of guerrillas in El Salvador, say, 20 years ago, uh, or, may, or the, for example, the Zapatista uprising in Mexico uh, in recent years. Uh, the military, the uprising involved 1,500 uh, guerrillas taking control of part of Dublin. Uh, unfortunately for them, their plan come to full fruition because the arms that were supposed to be landed from Germany didn't arrive. Uh, but if the plans had gone fully ahead, it was hoped that the British would be caught in the pincer movement between guerrillas occupying the centre of Dublin and, uh, if you like, people coming in from the countryside surrounding Dublin. Remember also the British garrison in Ireland had been severely depleted due to their need to send soldiers to the war. This was a serious uprising that, it is true, did not follow a mass popular upsurge, but nevertheless, in military terms, it was a serious uprising rather than simply a blood sacrifice. The Easter Rising was a serious military uh, op operation which had been careful planned, but many historians have tried to portray it as a blood sacrifice. Uh, how do you react to that? I would say there was, there was no idea of a blood sacrifice. This was too well organised. Um, to be classed as a blood sacrifice. The volunteers in the FINA, Citizen Army, coming them on, that went out on Easter Monday, they went out to win. They had no idea that they were going out to give up their lives for a blood sacrifice idea. Um, if you look outside of Dublin, if you go down to Galway, nearly a thousand men rolls in Galway. And it was just the lack of arms that, because of the odds being sunk, which had all the German weapons that was being brought in. Without those weapons, Basically, a lot of the volunteers didn't rise. How did the rebels perform militarily in that week of fighting in Dublin? Well, they handled themselves very well. Um, if you look at, on the mo Monday the 24th of April, there was probably about 2,000 British soldiers in Dublin at the time. Um, probably about 1,000 volunteers came out on the, on the Monday. By midweek, you then have uh, a British division landing in Ireland. So that brings the total number up to about between 18 and 20,000 British soldiers in Dublin at the time. The volunteers now have risen to about 1,500 to 2,000. But none of the positions were ever overrun uh, after Wednesday. They all surrendered on the, on the Saturday or the Sunday. Uh, you have the, like, the engagement at uh, Mount Street where 17 men held off 2,000 British soldiers for over eight hours. You've got North King Street which took uh, a, a battalion of 1,000 men um, oh, just nearly two days to march 150 foot down a street. So they handled themselves very well. Like I said, none of the positions uh, after Wednesday were ever overrun and any of the positions that were were only holding positions. They weren't supposed to be taken for the full length of the horizon. And just going back to the fighting in uh, uh, Dublin, I mean, at Mount Street, you mentioned, I mean, the, the British tactics there, I mean, it showed a sort of inexperience or a lack of knowledge of street fighting, did it not? Um, yeah, see, th they would have had a basic training in street fighting, but they wouldn't have had a training to deal with um, st street fighting where the actual population is still there. And the way the rebels did it was they, they would, it was like a leapfrog. They would have uh, two men in one house. They just caused havoc on an open uh, crossroads. And then they suppose it's supposed to get out and reinforce the next position and then keep falling back. And then there was, on, like you're saying, on overlooking Mount Street Bridge, there was Clan William House. Now there's about five in there. But if all the other positions fell back, you would have had about 14 men in there. But the British would have had to come across this bridge. Now, um, McInerney rang, uh, or got, so I shouldn't say rang, got in touch with General Lowe and told him, we're like having really bad problems here getting across this bridge. Do we have to go across this bridge? And he said, yeah, you do. Just keep going at it. Whereas if they'd have crossed by uh, Bagger Street Bridge, which they'd sent some men along, they would have had less casualties and they would have got to the same direction. So it was, I think it was the idea, they're only rebels. How can they be holding you up for so long? keep pushing at them. Um, well, you've got the two commanders on the ground, which was uh, Lieutenant Colonel Oates and Lieutenant Colonel Fane. 
Now, uh, Fane is with the 27th, which is the, the main, the first battalion going in, the 27th Robin Hoods. Now, he did what he did, they, he, they advanced in an open box formation, so that you've got a line of men across the road, and they're looking straight ahead. You've got two lines coming down the sides, and they're checking the house's side roads. So, he, his tactic there was correct, but it was the width of the road bunched them all up. And it was when they got to the junction with Haddington Road that Malone let loose from number 25 which, with Seamus Grace. Um, then they just kept going forward. They thought the schoolhouse was their objective, which was up on the right. They just kept trying to take the schoolhouse. Whereas they should have gone left and gone around and come back again. But it, they just kept pushing forward. <laughs> This photograph is probably staged after the event, but it gives some idea of the improvisation of the British forces. Inexperienced in street fighting, many of the men brought in to crush the Easter Rising had little training. The Sherwood Foresters who were brought to Dunleary, they marched into the city, were engaged at Mount Street Bridge. They lacked hand grenades, they lacked machine guns. Here we see a barricade which had been built from beer barrels with the British soldiers behind taking up fire, uh, firing position. As I say, it gives some idea of the improvisation the British forces had to use. They were learning, basically, the rules of street fighting, something the British Army had never been engaged in before in any significant way. One of the rebels' fixed positions, the South Dublin Union, there was a, a serious battle where the rebels did well. Uh, yeah, the South Dublin Union, there was, uh, the, on, the, on the first day, they were attacked by um, the British managed to force their way in through the, the Rialto Gate and the Canal Gate. And they started advancing from there. But all this time they're taking casualties because uh, the Maribone Lane Distillery is covering the back of the Union. That's if, if its position was there. They, they, with the South Dublin Union, they've taken outposts around it. So any sort of gate is covered. So uh, the first day they got, they actually pushed them all the way back to the north of the Union. But they were in good, like, uh, they were in the offices, the nurses' home. They had good, solid positions there. And for some reason, the British pulled out. They got the orders to pull out. And then on tours day, you then have the 27th and the 28th, who were on Mount Street the day before. Uh, the 27th were in a pretty bad shape. The 28th then took the four, and they attacked into the Union. Now, they got all the way up to where um, Kant's positions were, and there was like uh, fighting, like tight fighting around there. And, but the idea was they were trying to get the, the brigade um, divisional train over Rialto Bridge. So it was, they attacked, like I said, they attacked in, they, it was a holding while these got across. Once, once the attack was going on in the Union, they got across. Uh, the, the British soldiers pulled out, but they also then, at, at the same time, they attacked down towards uh, Marylebone Lane and they sort of suffered he heavy casualties down that way because the, the old canal that runs along there, which is the Lewis tram line now, and they took pretty heavy casualties. And in North King Street, I mean, again, the tactics were fairly strange. I mean, they ordered, at one stage, they ordered a, a charge down the street, openly down the street, on uh, rebel positions high above them. Yes. Um, what they didn't know about North King Street was, like you said, they got high positions, which is the Malthouse Tower in uh, the Jemison's factory. Now he's uh, he got one of the Shoulders brothers up there. And he's a sharpshooter, and he's just picking people off. You've also got the Bridewell, which is at the back of the forecourt. So that's in a high position as well, but that can shoot up to two junctions. You've got Riley's Fort then, which would be in front of them. And that's a four-story building. They're just firing down onto these. But what they did was they built barricades, so they've squared parts of the roads off. So once they've hopped into a barricade, they're surrounded by volunteer positions, and they're in a square. There's not much getting out. Now, they're, uh, that, that was the 2-6 Staffordshire Regiment, South Staffordshire Regiment. Now, their uh, commanding officer, Lieutenant Colonel Henry Taylor, he realised things was not going well. He actually taught on the feet and he, th he decided to use the rebel tactics. So he broke men, he got men, he got an armoured car, ferried men in and they smashed their way into houses and they started tunneling through the houses to bypass the uh, barricades, which was quite forward thinking uh, for a British uh, officer in those days. He was, he was thinking outside of the box. And in North uh, Dublin County, just outside the city, mm. uh, at Ashbourne there was one particular battle which was of a different nature and it kind of 
was the future in many ways for the, the Republican struggle? Uh, yeah, that would be uh, Thomas Ashe. Under, under his command was uh, Richard Mulcahy. Now, M Richard Mulcahy basically, Thomas Ashe, seen what Richard Mulcahy, his military prowess, and put him in charge of basically the, the attacking men, let's call them. And that's where you get the su successful engagement at Ashbourne. Now, that also, if you then go to Galway, if you throw Galway into that as well, that was the same sort of tactics used. You had about 750 men for definite. Now, uh, Liam Mellows was in charge down there, and he had so many men, he had to send some of them home because they had no guns for them. But they did the same sort of thing, they just kept moving, hitting barracks, kept moving. Uh, the British forces were constantly a day behind him. Any time they, uh, there's a Carnmore Cross, basically they just stumbled across a couple of companies of volunteers. The volunteers beat them back and then kept moving and just joined up. So uh, Mellows just kept moving around the county of Galway. They reckoned there was 600 square miles of free Galway during the rising. In the next episode, we will look at how the rebels were able to hold the centre of Dublin for a week against the forces of the British Empire and how the response of the British military to the Rising brought about a sea change in Irish attitudes to the Republican rebels.